Hello and welcome nostalgia nerds across the land and welcome once again to another edition of Jack's Throwback Attack. So it's a great pleasure to have with me an absolute legend of children's television for many years. It's Dave Benson Phillips. Hello. Hello. How are you doing today? Hello there. How, how are you doing? How are you doing? You all right? I'm good, good, good. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Good. So, so thank you very much for picking me as to be one of the cult people that you wanted to, to speak to. I am highly and hugely honoured. Thank you, sir. No problem at all. And it's very deserving because you, you did children's television for so many years. And I mean, how does it feel when people call you a legend and tell you that you made their childhood? Well, I'm always amazed when people say that I've, you know, I've made their childhood because they, they, well, let's face it, they're a lot older when I've met them, you know, so I never got to meet their, you know, their, their, uh, you know, them around the ages to, you know, four or above. Um, as you can tell, I'm a little bit thrown by this. Uh, it's, yeah, it's an amazing thing when you get sort of big tattooed burly blokes coming up to me going, you're my childhood. And it's like, Wow. Um, it is quite a phenomenal thing. As to being called a legend, I don't think I'm worthy of the title of legend, but the rest of it I can live with. But thank you. Oh, that's OK. I just think it's cool that, um, you know, you've never really changed what you've done in the last 30 odd years. You've always been a children's entertainer. You've never just done children's telly just as a career ladder thing. And you love entertaining children and you make a lot of time for people and especially your fans. And I think that's really cool. Well, thank you very much. I do. I mean, funnily enough, I've been very lucky in my line of work um, that I have been able to try other things performance wise. You know, things like pantos. I've done the odd drama. I've appeared in the odd action movie and stuff. And it's been great fun. But yes, you're right. Always at the end of the day, the phone calls I get are, you know, Dave, can you come along and entertain my children? And I have made... You know, I've made no attempts to leave that career behind because, let's face it, entertaining children, and you're right, has been such a part of my life. Even back when I was not much older than a t uh, you know, child myself, I was what? I was 14 or 15 when I started doing my first children's parties back in the day, and that was in my sort of back in uh, Wimbledon at the Polka Children's Theatre, which is, yeah, I'm very pleased to say I think it still exists but a great place. And yeah, I've been entertaining children ever since then. So yeah, integral part of my life. I couldn't imagine. Yeah, I couldn't imagine not doing it. Uh, so then, I understand prior to your television career, you started out entertaining children at holiday camps? Yes, I did. Yeah. So this was a little bit after the Polka theatre experience. Now, as you can imagine, I was at high school when I had that kind of job going on. So when I completely left school, I tried to do a bit in college, uh, I learnt retail, uh, dropped out of that, went to be, become a teacher, uh, dropped out of that as well. I was told that I was best suited for children's television. And I wound up then uh, going off for some auditions whilst I was unemployed. And one of them was Pontins. And, and I went along, hopefully to entertain the children, but I was seen as a bit too young at the time. And also the other thing was um, I did the audition wound up becoming a blue coat, entertaining the children that way, along with all my other blue coat duties. Uh, and I was the only black blue coat in the world at that point. There had never been another. So, yeah. And, yeah, yeah you're right. I did start entertaining the children. It was on the holiday camps. I learned how to do the craft then. Um, although I'd had some experience beforehand performing to children. But, um, yeah, but that's where I really honed it, and that's where I realised that I wanted to entertain children full-time. Oh, that's really cool. And uh, so from the uh, entertaining at the holiday parks, that's how you got your first yep. TV gig, which was Play Days, wasn't it? It was, yeah. That was another holiday camp. So I'd done uh, one year at one season, as it were, six months, at Camber Sands Holiday Village. you ever been to Camber Sands? No, I haven't. I'm not entirely sure where it is in the UK. Oh, it's near Hastings. It's a, it's a place, yeah, near near Rye and Hastings. It's all very much deepest uh, Sussex. Oh, okay, yes, yes, deepest yeah. East Sussex that way. And um, yeah, so I was stationed there, not far from Hastings, and it was very lovely, and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of children. And and then yeah, play days happened when I worked for Haven Leisure, now called Haven Holidays, and I I became a fully fledged entertainer. 
uh, this holiday camp in North Wales called Timawa, which I'm very pleased to say still exists. And it's just outside of a place called R- Rill and near a place called Abergelly, if you've ever been that way. And it was a really amazing place. And I learned a lot about performing to people there. And they were very supportive. And yes, somebody had seen me performing to 200 children. I think we were doing Swan Lake or something very daft. And somebody, I decided to get all the children to do ballet. I used to do stuff like that, just wacky stuff. And um, always with an eye to education. And the next thing I know, somebody had videotaped me performing and had sent it into the Beeb, unbeknownst to me, who said, listen, who is this man? And uh, and the next thing I know, I'm, I'm you know, going for an audition with this man uh, who's now since retired, I think. And he was a lovely guy called Peter Risdale Scott. And Mr. Risdale Scott looked at me. I hadn't known how to audition. And I just did all the things that I had in my case. So I sung songs and everything else. Because about 90 minutes later, they decided to stop me. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the next thing I know was they said, listen, we'll try and find you a job. And that was, uh, it was play school at the time. But then when I found out that I got the job and we were all celebrating in North Wales big time. And just as I was about to go back down south, as it were, they said that play school had already been sort of given the axe, as it were, and they were starting on new children's programmes, but I still went back down south because that's where I'm from. The next thing I know, there was something called Play Days going, and I went for the auditions, not realising one they had already had heard of me, but also the other thing that... that um, they said I was a bit, a bit inexperienced, but they'd given me a go. So when everybody else had contracts for nine months or a year, I had a contract for six weeks... And wow. I wound up staying in play days for, yeah, the better part of six years. So it was good fun. Yeah. It, it was, was a great way to learn television. Great and it, way to and it was TV. a great show. Um, which stop did you do? Because I couldn't remember. I was trying to think earlier. There was all I different present- stops. Yeah. I presented the playground stop, which was the stop where uh, Lizzie was. So Lizzie the puppet lived there. My little blue friend Chester, he lived there as well, as did I. And we would often play with the children who would come into the play days, sort of a playground stop, as it were, or I would go out and play with them. So, yeah, mine was very child-oriented and thankfully not too much of a script. Because <laughs> if I had a script in my head, that would have been really awkward. Do you know it took me 47 takes to say, hello, my name is Dave? That was my first ever day on television at <laughs> Oh man, that's uh, that's quite something. Yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> I bet I you. Can, I can still see it there. I can still see that. This poor cameraman just looked at me and just went <laughs> lunch, and that was it. After that, it was an entire morning, and I was just I was so nervous. But they, everybody decided to give me a go. I think somebody had had a chat with them during the lunch break, and plied the cameraman with booze and money, and they just said, "Yeah, let him make his mistakes." So yeah, I learned a lot, learned very quickly, and it was. A fantastic time on play days. Such an opener for me in so many ways. So, so many ways. Yes, and it was a show that became very popular and ran for ages and had so many episodes. And even when it finished, they repeated them for years and years and years. And it still pops up on social media now. (laughs) It wasn't made anymore. It's great. It was years. It was years before anybody said, no, we haven't made any programmes. Honestly, we haven't. Yeah, we made loads. It was really, it was a very interesting way of making mass television because back in those days, you know, before before it became as fragmented as it has now, television was often made by committee and they would start on an alphabet. So everybody would work from A to B to C with play days because there were so many bits and so many strands. You could literally send people off. It was virtually cottage industries. So you would have people who would write scripts for you, who would give them to somebody else, who would give them to somebody else. But they would all work independently of each other, but they would then work towards the same goal. So, you know, you, you'd end up working with loads of people that you hadn't seen before, uh, or you might not ever meet, but they've written stuff or performed stuff or, you know, built you props that you've used. And yeah, we were able to make hundreds of episodes. I mean, you only have to look at things like a great model would be Sesame Street, which I think is 
the best children's program that's ever been made. And if you think of how many letters are in the alphabet, 26, and how many numbers you can make, I mean, they've out of 26 letters in the alphabet, they've, they're they now on their 5,000th series. Sorry, 5,000th wow, episode. really? I mean, yeah, really. And it's the same sort of method. It's just like lots of bits filmed here and there. And, you know, they've got lots of links that they can put in, lots of little films they can put in and everything else. And Play Days was very much like that. So there were loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of bits going in, musically, visually, hourly, the whole bit. So they made hundreds of these things. And it was great. It was great to be a part of that. And it was a great show. Uh, but uh, there are lots of other shows that you took part in. And I think we've got to talk about the most famous one. I think you know what's coming. Has to be Get Your Own Back. How did that role come about? Oh, that one? Oh, yes, that right. one. So, here we go. How much time you got? <laughs> oh, got a while. Got all, you know, got many hours. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Oh, in that case, then, to, to make a short story long, this is how it all happened. Um, basically my agent and I were sort of discussing what things we could do for me vehicles wise that would get me into people's homes because they said play days was lovely but we need something else to, so as you can grow with your audience which I thought oh that's an interesting term but there you go anyway so we came up with this idea um, and we were talking with a guy it was myself a guy called Brian Marshall who used to be my manager and a guy called Peter Leslie, who was like one of the producers and directors and young up-and-comers of the then Children's BBC. And between the three of us, we hatched this idea about a revenge game show for children where they could get their grown-ups messed up by getting them to do sort of very silly and very humiliating games for whatever length of time we could. And I think it was me that came up with the phrase, get your own back which we then kind of hung everything off. But we sat in a pub, and it was it was done over a set of beer mats. And then from beer mats, it went to a nice piece of paper, went to a formal meeting, where we were told in no two uncertain terms the idea was stupid and infantile, and nobody would go for it. <laughs> and it literally was a few years, because originally we were looking at the slots. Do you remember Double Dare with Mr... Go on. Peter Simon, wasn't it? Peter Simon, that's right. Yeah. So we were looking, they were looking, the BBC were looking for a replacement for that. So they, you know, because Double Dare ran successively, but sometimes they needed to give it a break. And unfortunately, there was no other program that could match it. We thought Get Your Own Back would have been perfect. You know, 15 minutes, wild, wacky, nasty, amazing, silly stuff. And uh, they really did the beeb, the power of the beeb looked at it and they just went, nah. This is now. This is true. Who's going to go for this? What child is going to want to put their grown up in a load of guns? Get out. It's stupid. Go away. And so we did. And nothing more was said until one day we get a letter that basically said, Dear Dave and all people connected with Get Your Own Back, it's like this. We've mucked up on the scheduling. We've got a 15 minute clear spot. We can't put anything in it. Make your program. And it was like, Oh, all right. <laughs> So the next thing you know, we all went, yeah, a bunch of us went down to Bristol and I'm oversimplifying it, but that's how it really did happen. We went to Bristol, we filmed a pilot, we then filmed a couple more episodes and it was clear to the audience who'd seen the pilot and everything else that there was nothing like this ever on the telly because, you know, they'd seen muck and slime and, and slimy stuff and played noise in very loud games, but they'd never seen an end result where a grown-up would fall into a vat of gunge courtesy of a child pulling a lever or pushing a switch. And at that point, yeah, it, it became, it was really funny being in the studio and these kids go, when is this going to be on the telly? When is there going to be more of this? This is brilliant. This is brilliant. And that was the children in the studio. And I thought, well, in a studio environment, things make a lot of sense, but would it equate to the people out there? And, well, it did for 14 years. So, yeah, that's kind of how it began. That's like that's a long story short. There's lots more politics and sort of invitings and infightings. And, you know, we, it would be lovely to think one day they might make a, a, a biographical film of the makings of Get Your Own Back. That would be cool. I'd go and watch that. I'd pay to watch yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I want, to be, I, want to be, I want to be played by Chris Hemsworth. That's where I want to be. <laughs> I mean, Get Your Own Back was absolutely fantastic. You know, so many children loved that show, including myself, and it's one of the iconic shows of the 90s. It's amazing, really, that um, such a popular show 
was originally deemed as being rubbish. I think it's happened to quite a few classic shows down the years. I mean, how do you feel now looking back that that show was so successful and ran for so many years? I'm humbled by that. I really am humbled. Thank you very much for That's that. No problem. Yeah, we 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 were absolutely stunned. I mean, we would then got ourselves ready for the rule, and Mrs. Phillips would back me up if she were here to say it, that they had the rule three series and out. So imagine our surprise when, at the end of the third series of Get Your Own Back, and it had just become popular by that point, I never forget it. The executive producer came back in, Mr. Chris, uh, Mr. Uh, oh dear, with Christopher Pilkington, and he came in with a note in his hand, looking like Neville Chamberlain, and said, in my hand, I have a piece of paper, See you next year. We got another commission, and we just kind of went what? And it just kept happening like that every year for like twelve odd years. It was just mad. They kept recommissioning it and recommissioning it, and it was just wondrous. But yeah, you know, to be to to go from something that people thought was childish and silly um, is absolutely right. It was childish. It was silly, and it was aimed at the children. And if you didn't get that, then there you go. <laughs> But thanks for the commission. We were the enfant terrible. Um, you know, we even have the accolade of having one of our episodes banned uh, <laughs> on TV. Yes. As well. Yeah, so I heard the, about The that. infamous burning teddy bear. So, yeah, we 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 were like the punk rockers of our day. <laughs> we were up against Funhouse as well with Pat Sharp. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's all wild. It's all wild. It was wild. It was heady days. It was rock and roll. But so, uh, I mean, like you say, Get Your Own Back ran for a long, long time. But are there any moments that really stick in your head as, oh, that is just the most awesome thing? that is so funny oh goodness me because there were so many i mean you know put my, putting my first vicar into a vat of gunge because he, he couldn't sing very well and his choir boys elected to have him put in the gunge and in fact they drew lots to find out which choir boy because they all wanted to put him in it but which choir boy was going to get it and as he lost his games and everything he was sent into the gunge and his entire congregation and choir who had come along for the day all dressed in their cassocks and surplices and various holy gear, stood up and sung the hallelujah chorus as he hit the gunge. It was a bizarre moment. It was a bizarre moment. And I found myself saying, we're gathered here. I mean, we, we were irreverent. What was the other one? Um, being put in the gunge by Mr. Blobby, because everybody knows that I love like trivia questions and I read a lot. And, you know, I'm not the guy to play with in a pub quiz unless if we're on the same side. And, um, and it was just really funny having Mr. Blobby ask me questions, going, blah, 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 and I'm having not a clue of what's coming out of his face. And I'm thinking, you, pink and yellow so and so. I'm not liking it. So, of course, I went in on that time. So that was good. Uh, trying to negotiate with Ant and Deck to get them on the show, and their management were not playing ball. That was another time. Um, talking to Jonathan Ross. Jonathan Ross wanted to be on the show, and so as did Paul. But he had to go off and do the Oscars, and that was the end of that. Um, what else was there? Some mad things. I mean, we did mad, mad things on Get Your Own Back. We did a lot of series where things were mad. But standout moments? I'm trying to think. Mrs. Phillips? Emma? Oh, she's gone. Because oh. Emma and I, we both, we both worked on the show. She's my wife. And uh, yeah. that's how we met, actually. He was on, on the set of uh, Get, Get Your Own Back. We, you know, our eyes locked together over a vat of gunge, and that was the end of it. Um, it was lovely. But, yeah, we worked on so, so many, so many shows, so many of them. Um, yeah, just so many. It'll come back to me as we're talking. <laughs> but there were loads of heady moments. But those are the ones that I've suggested then. Oh, sorry, suggested. Those are the ones that I talked about. Those are the ones that sprung to mind, so they were great. Yeah. And you mentioned as well being gunge, which I think happened a few times. What's it like to be dropped in that vat of sludge? Well, being part of the crew that helped mix it, it was a bit weird, actually. It's like, like making your own gallows. It was... Um, very slimy stuff, very slippery, and it doesn't act like water at all. Yes, it is moving. Yes, it, it, it's it, it's like water in the sense that it's wet, but it's a different beast. I mean, you know, with water, it goes in your ears, it comes out of your ears. With gunge, it just goes in there and just stays. It just likes to find little creases on your body where it likes to sit and fester for a while. It is a very, very weird thing. It's also very encompassing, and when you fall into it, you can't hear anything. 
you literally go in and it's that thick. It blocks out all noise. It is the most bizarre, bizarre extreme. I'm, I'm quite amazed that somebody hasn't cottoned on to using it for therapy. <laughs> you know, like when people put you in tanks, like those flotation tanks yeah. in the dark. Mate, they don't need that. You just need warm gunge slap you in it with a straw <laughs> above your head. You'd be fine. Maybe it's a business venture you can start, you know, you know, like a retirement plan. <laughs> I don't plan. think they take it from me seriously. I don't <laughs> think they take it from me seriously, but hey, thank you very much. <laughs> I will uh, consider it. <laughs> and uh, I mean, you briefly mentioned it earlier, but I was watching a programme on the TV a few months back called Britain's Favourite Game Show, which you were on, and you mentioned about the banned episode yes. with the toy getting burned. Could you explain that? And was it really banned? Did that really happen? It really, again, it really, the incident really did happen. And the episode I didn't realize was actually banned, not until it was actually confirmed on the air by Firm Britain's lovely dulcet tones saying the program has been banned. And even when you go online on the internet, and that's the real proof of it, is you put in get your own back burning teddy bear, you never see it. You see, you see people talking about it, but you never see this said episode because it was considered too traumatic. So, yeah, and what happened was, I mean, as, as if you've seen the programme, we explained that back in those days we had a, a particular way on Get Your Own Back where we said if a child um, didn't get the chance to go into their grown-up, they had to forfeit their most treasured possession. Now, people never minded when, you know, a pair of Nike trainers or, um, went up you know, valued at 200 pounds. No, nothing like that. It was this young girl um, who had a teddy bear, but she had like something over 200. So this was a least favorite bear. And we put it on the, 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 in the oven. And the thing about the oven was nobody knew it had a drop tray. So the flames would shoot up on a gas ring around the item. In order to save it, you just basically drop the tray send the flames up, and it looks like there's some ferocious burning going on. So imagine that surprise. We sat the bear in the middle. We practised it. We waited the bear. We knew what was going to happen. And in the rehearsal, the bear always went down in the drop tray, and the flames went up, and it was great. So come the day, come the, 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 the famous, the infamous day, I'm giving the lead up. I say to the girl, I'm going to have to talk to your bear. See you later. Boom, up went the flames. The bear decides to lean into the flames and the cameraman filmed it and we got the whole thing and the audience were, were just like oh my god it went up and of course the bear, yeah the drop tray worked like it did but the bear by that point was being seen to be burnt we showed the episode well that was it you, there was the, it, it hit the national news hit the national newspapers uh, i had to make an apology on uh, points of view at the time with Anne Robinson. Oh I had to make three apologies that day. I didn't leave the BBC uh, TV studios for that day, and I literally apologised on every programme. Uh, there was it was also coincided with the 75th anniversary of Rupert Bear. <laughs> so Paul McCartney couldn't make a particular date to open a library um, section somewhere in North London, and has suggested that I go and do it in his place. <laughs> <laughs> so off I went on this voyage of contrition amongst my other duties I had to do. And, you know, and there were people there saying, oh, the bear burners come to say hello on behalf of Rupert Bear <laughs> and Paul McCartney. Yeah, that got interesting. Very interesting. You see, the British love their teddy bears. Yes, they do. So <laughs> it, it was, yeah, quite an amazing thing. It was, yeah, but it's still, like I said, banned, infamous band, never seen it. Um, I'd like to see it again on the video, but I would never have the chance to see it because as far as I know, the BBC have either got copies or they've, well, they've burned copies themselves. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think they even use it as part of the training exercises as well. They say this is not to happen on children's television and they show a bit. So yeah. <laughs> very infamous. Very, very infamous. I can see why they didn't bring that feature back the next series. No, well, yeah, that's right. But we did all sorts of things. We always, that, that was the thing about Get Your Own Back. Although the ending was more or less the same, where a grown up would go in the gunge, we had different ways of approaching it. And I think that was one of the things that kept the show interesting. Definitely. And talking of changes, actually, because like, like I said, the show ran for quite a long time. 
And then yes, it did. towards the end, there was a bit of a refresh to the show. I mean, you'd hosted the show on your own for the, most of it. And then towards the end, there was a yeah. co-host brought in called Lisa Brockwell. And I've got a few questions about that, actually. One was, why did that happen? And two, whatever became of her? Um, she does a lot of stuff nowadays with keep fit and yoga and exercises and ting. And she's very big in that world. Wow. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Rockwell. I'm talking. Yeah. Oh, sorry about this. Yeah, my wife's just popped in, Mrs. <laughs> That's Phillips. That's all right. <laughs> and, uh, and and yeah, she worked on the show. She used to be the contestant researcher, so it was her job to go out and find children to be on my show and the adults as well. So that's how we met. And so she had a tough old job. Now, getting back to Lisa B, Lisa Brockwell, she's done lots of things for sort of Nickelodeon and independent channels. And they brought her in so as to help me because I was getting a bit old and fat and a bit doddery. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, in she came. Because the one thing about Get Your Own Back was, yeah, the, it was a male host. And it was always often young boys trying to get their parents or teachers or people into the country. And there was a lot of men. So it was quite the sausage fest, really. So it was nice to have this beautiful female there, quite feisty and yeah, good tongue in her head. And she was lovely. And I did a couple of series with her. And, yeah, it was great. Oh, she good. was lovely. Good. lovely. So if the BBC mm -hmm. contacted you and said, Dave, we want to revive Get Your Own Back, would you still do it? Yes, no question I would do it. In fact, we, we've hatched plans here at uh, Benson HQ and it's never far from our thoughts because even though it wasn't off the t it's been off the telly for a while, we're always asked to flesh out or, or to try new ideas uh, and we've always had it in a state of prepared readiness just in case if we get the call. Oh, good. I hope one day it happens. That would be brilliant. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, and yeah, because I've got a load of guns. Doing a lot. <laughs> uh, there's just this mad image that you just keep guns at home now, <laughs> just constantly in vats, just ready and waiting. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's so much. So it's even got you know, there's like you know, there's there's the first ones that I mixed back in 1995, and there's you know <laughs> Benson's old peculiar that sits in the corner. <laughs> Funnily enough, for all the for all the various powders and things that we put together, I actually do have names like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> like one called Old Socks. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. I also want to kind of go on to some of the other shows that you did as well, which perhaps, you know, aren't as well remembered. Um, you've done a lot of singing and dancing and a lot of writing songs for children. And that led you to yes. hosting the Fun Song Factory, which was quite popular as well. Oh, yes. Huge show. That was still huge. And still, even now, I mean, people still now trade the videos and DVDs of the of the series of the Fun Song Factory. And of course, there was two types. There was the original one. And then there was one, no, three. There was, so there was the original stage show, then the TV series, which I took part in. And then many years later, they had a revamp with the, which appeared... Uh, Aston Merigold, I think, before he went off to become JLS or something. So that was quite amazing. And to be a part of that alumni was insane. It started off as an idea, as a, just a one-off video. Again, like you say, back to the accidents thing, back to the, the trying stuff out. And it was just, it was just, let's do this one video for the Preschool Learning Alliance to help with their cause, help fundraise, and, you know, and because they wanted to do things like give ch as many children as they can free, you know, nursery attendances and stuff, because let's face it, it costs a lot of money. And uh, we thought, okay, this would be a nice fundraiser. I was approached by Ian Lachlan and Will Bradenton, who have both become huge friends of mine over the years. And it was just like, Dave, would you like to be in this show? We did the show, we sung the songs, we did the rhymes, and they had never seen... And again, it was another thing like Get Your Own Back where they were in the studio saying, when can we buy this on video? When can we buy this? And the question that they all asked was, is there going to be any more of this? And then all of a sudden, these two guys went, well, what's going to happen now? And it, it just took off. So the Fun Song Factory um, itself became this mammoth show where we would do these shows on video we would sing loads and loads of nursery rhymes we would put on outfits we'd sing medleys we'd be performing with children children would be performing with us adults and it just went on and these two guys then 
to the way that things went, they hatched other programs, including the Tweenies, which was theirs. And, and the, yeah, but working on the Fun Song Factory and make, helping to make that happen was an incredible thing. And if you could have been in the studio at the time to see these children who were brought along by their parents expecting somebody to sing some nursery rhymes, but not in the way they expected, and they were just hooked. Bright colours, jolly singing, jolly dancing, um, and it was just, yeah, and it was just amazing. It was an amazing thing to be a part of, and yeah, it was yeah, it was. Uh, when I think about it now, it makes me smile. It makes me smile. And again, like you say, and it doesn't happen, but with me, it happens a lot where people just go, "Here's an idea. We'll just do it the once. We don't think it will go any further than that." And then. Oh, wow, it did. And boy, did it ever. Good stuff. Another happy accident. A great and happy accident to be a part of. And it was just, yeah, it was an incredible thing. The production values on it were so high for a children's show. It was, it was, it was almost, it was never been seen before like that. And for it to be on video, and of course in those days, you know, special interest programs went on video. They didn't go on television like they do now because we have so many channels and you can look at all sorts of things. It was like, you know, the most popular videos and VHSs at the time were always things to do with fishing. You know, people would go off and fish and stuff like that. And then there wasn't much for children's television. So they would put on old programs on VHSs and hope that it would land. So when something came along like this, the Fun Song Factory, where there were lots of human beings dancing, and singing and singing nursery rhymes and, you know, having an audience of people joining in. It was just so incredible for these people to watch. It literally, yeah, it was word of mouth and it went on to do some great stuff and made a lot of, changed a lot of people's lives, changed a lot of people's lives. Good. And also amongst the videos as well is one Justin Fletcher. Do you know what? I thought I recognised him when I was having a look on YouTube last night. I'm thinking, he looks a lot like Mr Tumble. <laughs> I should have looked a bit closer. And uh, one of the uh, other shows that you did on CITV, which I do remember, is a Saturday morning show called Wake Up in the Wild Room. I do remember that. Was yes. that good fun? Yeah, that was great fun. Again, my wife and I, we worked on that. And Peter Leslie, the man who helped put Get Your Own Back Together, was the guy who said, right, would you, would you like to take the Disney dollar for a while and work with me on this children's TV programme that goes out Saturday mornings? And we did that for two years, that one. That was a lovely show to do. So me, Fluff and Scruff, the bed mites, um, and people coming to visit my house and play wild and wacky games. Yes, I do remember it. It was one of those shows which I remembered, and then I kind of kind of forgot about it for a while. And then the internet came along, and someone put some episodes online. It was like, ah, oh, I remember that. And the thing I remember most is there was a game at the end where the children had to throw dirty laundry at the windows of the house to knock these pictures over. But then there was this really random moment when a guy would turn up dressed as a milkman and custard pie the Gary children. The yeah, Gary the... Was it Gary the Ghost or Gary the Milkman? I can't remember Gary, now. Yeah, Gary the Ghost, dressed as a milkman. Yeah, Gary the Ghost it was. And uh, it was, he was lovely. <laughs> it was very random. I wonder how that came about. Oh, again, this was the, this was the mind, the inner workings of Peter Leslie, and nobody knew how his work his workings were, and he was just, um, yeah, he he was just he was yeah, Gary the Ghost. He was like a, a milkman who had died on his rounds and came back to haunt people, and he hated kids, and uh, we just had him in the show, and he was just great. He was just lovely. It was a great show. I do remember it. It was. It looked uh, like great fun. Another one as well that I remember, which I, I I wonder if many people come up to you and ask you about it, because I don't think it ran very long, but it was a bit of a, a bizarre concept for a game show, and that was Pet Swap, which was, okay. which was children <laughs> swapping roles with their pets and dressing up as pets and playing games in, like, Absolutely. big hamster wheels and stuff like that. Absolutely, yeah. It was one of those ones where... It was it was quite a dream team. It was all put together for one spectacular series, and we we're waiting for the commission that never came. But the viewing figures at the time were really good because it was one of those things. You know, what 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 would it be like to be your pet? And then yeah, it's that sort of thing. So yeah, it gave us a chance to put together some giant props and play on giant games. And also for me to work with Fern Cotton as well was a joy to work with. So she was lovely. Yeah, so yeah, but like you say, one series it was, but the ratings were high 
but for some reason, just it just wasn't commission friendly. Sometimes that happens with shows. Sometimes you don't get runners, and this one, this one had a runner all over it. This one was a hit, but for some reason, didn't get a recommission. But that said, people loved the show. I was one of the people who watched it. I do remember it firsthand. And um, about a year ago, someone did put an episode on YouTube. It's like I hadn't seen seen it since it was on originally, and it was like, my God, what what a crazy idea for a game show. Uh, but it looked like, it looked quite. Well, I've fun. got to see it myself. <laughs> I've got to see. It. I haven't seen it. Yeah, they used to get me to do, to make blues songs and stuff at the end, and sometimes I was, I wrote the songs, and they were so fresh in my head that I couldn't remember what I'd written. So I used to have somebody standing off behind the camera with a music score and lyrics, and they'd have to put on these dark glasses so as I could see where the words were, and nobody could see me reading. So I had to sight read my own stuff. It was wild. Very wild, very funny, very fresh stuff. Well, I can say that the episode is still on YouTube because I saw it last night, so it's still there if you just type in Pet Swap. I should take a look at this after that. I shall, I shall crack up the computer. I said crack, not crank, because people keep trying to get me to say things like crank it up all the time. <laughs> he said crank it up. I heard him say... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> Oh dear, dear! I can imagine. I can imagine that's the one, the one downside. The amount of people who come up to you just wherever you are, even if you just go shopping, just to talk to you and just to ask you, can you say this? Can you say that? Can you talk about this? Oh yeah, they do that. Can, can you laugh? Well, I say, go. Can you do something funny? And it's like, no, I'm not laughing then. <laughs> um, so there's, I mean, oh god, what have I had? Um, oh yeah, I was eating the chicken in front of somebody, and I mean, it was very funny. And it and it dropped on the table and the table was leaning and this and I said oh and it said I suppose you want to get your bone back and I thought <laughs> oh that's really <laughs> that so, is funny yeah I'll give I'll give you that one <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah dear. Oh. he couldn't believe his luck when he got that out it was great but there was another guy that I was working with who told me a time when oh what is it? I think he was in the West Country and. Noel Edmonds didn't live that far, so we'd often go into his supermarket to shop. And he did that thing where, of course, you know, Noel Edmonds is looking for something on the shelf. So, you know, have you got any tins of peas or this particular brand of sauce or what have you? And my friend who was working just went, sorry, not realising who it was, he went, ah, sorry, mate, no deal. And couldn't understand why this, why this guy walked off in the half and tried to get him sacked. And it turned out it was Noel Edmonds. So, yeah, it, abso- it happens a lot. You know, a catchphrase will come and haunt you and bite you on the buttocks. But, yeah, so that's very lovely. I don't mind. <laughs> and uh, what was it like as well um, doing links for Playhouse Disney? Because that must have been quite hard doing, quite hard work doing that every day. That was an interesting one because, again, it goes back to the way that, um, like I had done years before with Play Days, where they would film bits and then cobble them all together. When filming links like that, it was a very similar, similar thing. So we would literally come in, have the same gear on, and we would repeat the same shots. So say, for instance, we're going to do all the Mondays for the year. So we do all the Monday links, and then we do the Tuesdays the next day. I mean, they worked us very, very hard. And yes, and we would repeat the same thing. When we did music time, it wasn't one episode. We'd do something like 15 or 16 songs in that kind of time in half a day. And then we'd take the other half of the day to just to rest and then to practice the next songs that we would do the next day. And then we, we would repeat those as well. So, yeah, it was very, very, very intense. Very intense. Intense was what it was. Yes, and I do remember watching it. I, I remember, uh, I remember uh, you were Big Dave, and there was Little Alex as well. I remember that. Well, you must have watched the posh kids with a satellite television because back in those days, that was you know people who watched that on satellite. That was money back then because you know satellite was still that thing that you know only sports pubs had. I remember I, we had Sky for a couple of years and then we stopped having it because my dad said it was too expensive. But I remember we, yeah. we had to subscribe to, to Disney for Disney Channel. We had to subscribe for like for a month and then because like we'd, we'd, we'd have Sky and that would come with the kids channels. But Disney Channel and Playhouse Disney were extra and you, ha- you could only have them for a month and then you'd have to pay this extra amount again. So every now and again as a treat, my parents would pay to have the Disney Channel and Playhouse Disney. And I used to watch them both. And I remember you on that. And I also remember the cookery programme Bite Size as well that you did as well. I remember that. Yes. We made Deep Fried Dave. Oh, I remember doing that. I used to love doing that. That was great. I got to cook. And... Oh, my goodness me. I've just pulled it up. 
<laughs> Pet swap. <laughs> Oh, you found it. Yeah, I found it now, so I'll take a look at that. It's all right. I'll, I'll just turn it off now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, again, very interesting. Very interesting, that one. Bite Size was great because Mitzi, the oven glove, she was fabulous. And, uh, you know, being able to cook, it was one of those things, it sort of let loose my inner chef, as it were. So we had, we, again, the way that we filmed that one, we'd do, like, almost an entire series in three days. And so I would li- they would literally get us in. I would learn how to make these various dis- dishes and desserts and then take my life in my hands and cook food, which sometimes isn't fit for human consumption, and make it look gorgeous. And then we'd start the whole process again. So, yeah, we used to bang out about oh, – that's the wrong word. But we used to <laughs> we used to produce about 15 or 16 of these things in a couple of days. You know, but it was lovely to do. Very intense, very busy – but, you know, at the end of the day, we made several very, very good sets of programmes. Yes, you did. And I enjoyed watching them. I was one of the many, many people who enjoyed watching them. Yeah, no, I was really surprised because, like I said at the time, I mean, satellite television was hugely expensive back then to subscribe. I mean, that's a lot of money. I, do you know what? I've, I've made lots of things for satellite television, but I've never seen them. You know, because I used to say to people, can I have a videotape of it? And of course, people didn't do that back in those days. Otherwise, they'd be doing videos for everybody. And there's one person who wants to turn around and said, well, what would be the purpose of that? Get a satellite TV like the rest of the world. And it's like, well, the rest of the world can't afford it. And, and like the presenter who's in the show. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I tried to catch one for years, but they weren't having it. But yeah, very expensive things to watch. So I very seldom saw... Any of the stuff I've seen, I did on satellite, which is a bit of a shame. But apparently I was good. Well, I can tell you that when I was doing a bit of research last night, there is some Playhouse Disney footage on YouTube. If you type in Playhouse Disney and put Dave Benson and Phillips in, it, it does come up with some clips. Oh, my goodness. I, I shall do that later. Sir. You'll be on YouTube all night now researching all your old programmes that you didn't know were on YouTube. Yeah, and I'm wondering why people say to me that you haven't changed. I've actually looked at this clip, and I really haven't changed much. I'm, I'm, you really I'm haven't. now probably the same. You really haven't for like 25 years like since you started. <laughs> That's bizarre. It's like teachers, isn't it? Teachers are like that. Your teachers never change. No, they don't. That's, they what, don't. I, that, that's what I've heard. But they... <laughs> and uh, so out of all the programmes that we've mentioned over the last yeah. uh, nearly an hour or so, are there any others that really stick out as a fond favourite? Any other highlights? Oh, do you know what, sir? I'm just thinking they all stayed in my mind for lots of different reasons. I mean, I've been very lucky as a children's entertainer, not only because I've been entertaining children, but also my my love of television. I've been able to be on television, uh, again, entertaining the children and doing other things within it. So it hasn't always about been about sorry, doing fluffy stuff for children. I've done some great stuff as well, helped out in your drama, was, a, was a, uh, an entertainment consultant for Grange Hill at one point. Um, I've done all manner of amazing things. So to be able to say which was my favourite or which one stands out, they all sir, stand out for many a different reason. They all feed that are part of my... I guess the way that I perceive things, they all appeal to parts of my nature. So, of course, you know, when I've done the live television stuff, that appeals to me because it's the here and the now, and I love that sort of stuff. When I did Get Your Own Back, that was like my game show host. That was my way of looking at the generation game, which is, I've got to admit, the one show, if anybody said to me, what show would you like to do? I would say without question, if I was to go to adult TV, Gen Game. Generation game. I grew up with that as a kid, and I always wanted to be Bruce Forsyth, and that was the show that I always wanted to do. Even when I met Sir Bruce, I had told him that, and he said, "Yeah, I've seen your stuff. My grandson likes you. Yeah, you'd be all over that." And you know, I, I still wait. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, any any favourite program? No, they all appeal to me in different ways. Actually, going back to you saying that you did many things within television and stage and drama and that, I've just remembered, didn't you appear in an episode of Chucklevision once? I did. I did. Yeah, that was drama in itself. No, it was a wonderful thing. I was the DJ who was chucking them out of my radio station. That's so, it. Yes, I yes, yes, yes. I just yeah, randomly yeah. thought. I, I'm sure, I said, I'm sure he's been in an episode of Chucklevision, but I wasn't sure if I was dreaming it up. I just <laughs> thought. 
So, it, uh, funnily enough, seeing them, I mean, at the time, many, many years ago, again, back in North Wales, so you can imagine how this is. This My, my then-girlfriend at the time, because uh, I'd never been to Blackpool, and where Rill is in, geographically in relation to uh, um, Blackpool, it's not that far. And so for my great day, out, day off of all day offs, she took me to Blackpool and she more or less changed my life um, because she took me to see the, the Blackpool Pleasure Beach. She told, yeah, she taught, she showed me how the Brits do entertainment in Blackpool. Ooh, it's like Vegas of the North. And, um, and it was an amazing thing. And one of the things that I remember doing was seeing the Chuckle Brothers do their show as the Chuckle Hounds. And then they had their other brothers that joined them, the Patton Brothers. And they did this amazing show. And of course, they were on you know, the Children's BBC channel at the time. And they had this place full and the place was rocking. And there were lots of children who were sort of you know, loving what they were doing. And I thought, I want to be those kind of people. And so imagine my surprise some years later, I'm sitting in the audience you know, um, watching these guys before my career really took off to one day I'm on a, I'm on a set with them. You know, I'm helping out with them. I'm doing a season with them in Scarborough, that sort of thing. And that was amazing. And the, to be there in the episode of Chuckle Vision, doing a bit of acting and throwing these two out was hilarious. Man. We had a great couple of days on there. But yeah, and also even, I think I did their, their game show To Me To You as well. That was, that was a funny show. Yes, um, it was. Yeah, my wife worked on that. So, yeah, it was, yeah, great thing. So watching the Chuckle Brothers, they were highly influential. Definitely, yeah. And the Chuckle Brothers, just absolute legends of children's television. And I bet it's really cool to be able to say, I worked with the Chuckle Brothers. It was so, so cool to say that. It was just the most amazing thing to say. Oh, yeah, I've worked with the Chucks. And I could call them the Chucks. <laughs> and it was great. So, yeah. I really did. I loved it. And, you know, over the years we got to talk and everything. So it was a very sort of sad thing when, you know, when Barry went, um, we were all still shocked about that. We knew he was a bit ill, but we didn't realize just how ill he was. Um, and it was very bad, very, very awful. But, you know, but I hear from Paul every now and again. And funnily enough, we were talking about it. It's like 25 years ago. I think it was last week that Chuckle Visions was first seen on the box. And you just kind of go, oh, was it back then? <laughs> oh, dear. It was, yeah, it just, it seems like yesterday. I can still remember the phone call, you know, <laughs> talking to his mates and stuff and saying, do you really want me on the show? Yeah, we well, laugh, Dave. Right, this is what you do. <laughs> How many lines have I got? Not many. All oh, good, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's really good that's really good and it's, it's it's been great to hear all these memories of uh, being in children's television i kind of want to move on now to like more more recent stuff um i, I guess i've got to mention it even though i imagine you probably prefer it didn't but there was um some rumors that went around online some years ago which kind of caused a few issues and there was kind of like a bit of a dip in your career but then you use the internet as uh, a tool to get yourself back up there again which was i think really cool yes yeah. being you know waking up in the morning and, be, and discovering that you've been killed in a car crash mm. is is no fun particularly when people believe it and it was really sort of career very career damaging and in those days nobody knew how to deal with things like that and the easiest thing would have been to have said was phone the house and say dave are you all right but a lot yeah. of people didn't think like that. They just kind of read it and they just went, oh, that's a shame. And, you know, people at the B, even people, the powers that be sort of went, well, if he's not there, let's just get somebody else in to do shows. Let's abandon these projects, this, that, and the other. And I was touring at the time. And in those days, of course, I didn't have any internet presence. I just had a an email account and that was about it. That's what most people had. And there were these unscrupulous people out there who would set up fake accounts and and do all sorts of things or report things. And none of us were none the wiser. The internet was fairly new. Um, people weren't wise to it. People didn't take things, you know, people, you know, people didn't uh, mistrust it in the way that they do now. They certainly didn't look at it and go, oh, hang on, I'll research this before I believe it. They just kind of believed it because it was written. So, you know, waking up in the morning and having that happen and then, you know, your, your work goes down because people believe it. And then sort of, you know, five years in you're thinking hang on this is really stupid you know people were taken in and didn't know how to react when it happened or what to do with themselves when they suddenly realized they had been taken in 
it's it was a very difficult thing so you know having to learn how the internet works was our first plan of action and of course it's a beast that changes with every passing day with every passing moment and the one that, and the awful thing about it is is that of course you know we know there are people behind the algorithms but talking to the people behind the algorithms was very very difficult so there was lots of things we had to do and uh, amongst all the other things we had to do apart, apart from the obvious which is having to sign ourselves into various accounts was to sort of make shows about the internet and have a pop back at the people who are in charge of it in various ways. So yeah, it was it was quite the plan. It was quite the plan. Yes, I mean at the time there was a bit of an awful trend of people creating these terrible hoaxes that various nineties kids TV personalities had passed away. So it was a really terrible thing, and it happened to quite a number of people. My mother, she was just this is just before she retired, but she was a nurse in the hospital, and the first that she'd heard of it was she came into work and somebody has said, I'm so sorry for your loss of your son. So yeah, it's been oh, no. yeah, it's been reported that Dave was killed in a car crash on the way to talk and she actually quoted what she'd read. And at one point it had been actually put out as news by the BBC. I think that's what they oh, wanted. That's even really. worse. And mm. so my mum phoned the house. I mean she can still remember the phone call. And Emma took the call, which was even worse because it wasn't me that picked up the phone. And it was normally me that always picked up the phone in the house. And, of course, Emma was on the phone and, like, mum was thinking, you know, is my son all right? Is he OK? What's this about? Dave says, well, yeah, he's downstairs. He's he's um, he's milling about. She thought, downstairs, he's in the casket. And, um, and literally, she wouldn't stop until I was on the phone. And then, of course, I had to go around and see her just to make sure that it was me. Um, and that was horrible, having my mum brought into this, my whole family were on the phones to each other. It even got as far as Barbados, because, of course, that's where my family howled from. And, of course, you know, they were, yeah, one of their own sons, it was reported out there as well, one of their own sons from England, uh, you know, born of the bus driver, um, has been slain by a car in a car crash. So, it, yeah, it went international. And it was really, really horrible, because, you know, having to quell all of that, having to pacify my mum was just about the worst thing ever. Um, I got to talk to, oh God, Keenan and Kel as well, because of course they both suffered it. But one had suffered it to the worst degree, where he didn't work at all. Most of the people who were reported dead celebrities-wise, they were sort of died in humour-related things. So, for instance, one of the Chuckle Brothers died of a, of a laughter-related incident. Oh, yeah. Neil Buchanan of Art Attack died of a heart attack. That sort of stuff, and uh, and it was just it was just horrible. But mine was reported as actual news, and some people took it on. My local radio station, um, they were literally two minutes away from doing an obituary. I mean, we'd done a lot of stuff with the radio station, so of course they had all this stuff, and they more they more or less were going to dedicate an hour to my passing, as it were. And somebody saw all the off chance. We'll just put a phone up and make sure he is dead. Here it goes. And they were relieved to find that they were two minutes away from giving me a glowing obituary. So it wasn't nice at all. And, you know, to a certain degree, we're still having to live with the spectre of it. But, you know, we're, we're, we're clawing back. You know, yeah. people still pick mm. up the phone, which is lovely. And the awful thing about it is, is once it took hold and they realised it could take hold, then you get all manner of nasty people coming out and trying all manner of stuff and games and prankery and everything else. And that's the bit that came with it, which we didn't like at all. And it was really quite painful, very hurtful stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, and we lived with it for a long old time. So, yeah, nearly 10 years worth. Yeah. So we're just, we're just kind of out of it now. And believe it or not, you know, people still ask about it. People still talk about it. And, you know, it still affects us in different ways. We get very rattled. It's changed the way that we do a lot of our business. Um, yeah, it changed me a lot as well. Yeah. The one good thing is, is that, like you say, you've clawed it back. I've noticed that in the last couple of years, you've really used the internet to your advantage because, you, you know, you're very active promoting your shows and tours and you're saying, you know, I'm available for bookings. You know, you do the university shows, the 90s concerts, a lot of charity work, children's parties. There's also wrestling, I've noticed, and also oh, the... Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so 
I did that. You see, I was back in the day. Again, this was a Pontins thing. And one of the other things I learned in the in the world of entertainment was about the art of the, the noble art of wrestling, which I kind of got into and did it for a while as a younger man. So imagine my surprise when some years later, um, you know, the, the, somebody thought, oh, a bright idea. Somebody had seen me wrestling at a fun day. So, yeah, so imagine my surprise when, um, you know, somebody had seen this video of me wrestling and said, oh, this would be a good idea. Dave, do you fancy wrestling? And I kind of went, oh, go on then. And we talked about it, and it was a bit like, okay, Pride Weekend, it's Brighton. It's going to be great. Let's take a look. There'll be 250 people looking. Nobody will see it that much. It'll be okay. It'll be a bag of fun. So imagine my surprise. I get there. There's nigh on 800 people in this room, and it just got stupid. You know what I mean? I tag team wrestled with a lady called Session Moth Martina from the flats. She's lovely. And if you know you're wrestling, she is she's very respected. And then she was fighting alongside this old duffer, me. And, um, yeah, we won our belt, I'm pleased to say. And it was just wild. So that was good. So that, that hit the internet. Apparently the internet broke down the day they released the film footage, which I still find very difficult to believe, but there you go. Um, yeah, it was – yeah, it's so – you know, it's, it's not even a case of clawing back. It's just a case of just finding somewhere to make a presence. You see, the thing about television is, even though you do things where, you know, you're in the front of the camera, you're on everybody's thoughts, and then all you have to do is just be quiet for a while and people have assumed that you've gone or other things have happened. And in my case, you know, I, I didn't do too much. Somebody thought, you know... No doubt, yeah. Or oh, just Dave Burson Phillips. Nobody will miss him that much. And he's quite a soft target, and it, you know, it just whatever they did just took hold. People believed it, and you know, as a result, you know, we, I didn't work for about a good seven or eight years. You know, it, it really did hit into things. But that said, you know, we learned how the internet works. We took up our, up our opportunities, and now, you know, I'm very pleased to say that, you know, people do ring me up. People do sort of pick up the jobs for phones. In fact, I've done several over the years. Oh, my goodness me, I'd appeared in an episode of Sooty as the Genie. Mm -hmm. Just recently, I appeared as a children's entertainer for Danny and Mick on, on the CBBC channel. In fact, it, it opened this Monday, and I was still in the field in Leeds, so I hadn't realised it's gone out. But I did, uh, I did a cameo in the middle of that done voices and stuff for Mr. Bean, the animated series. So anytime you see a black character and stuff, that'll be me all over that. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm still there doing it. And it's yeah. lovely because, you know, people, you know, they pick up the phone, which is a lovely, lovely thing. I'm glad so, yeah, it so still you, happens. That's to my advantage. So all them trolls can just, you know, you can just kiss it, quite frankly. <laughs> so there you go. And there was also that online mockumentary series as well, getting back with Dave Benson oh! Phillips. What was your reaction when you were approached with that idea? How did that come about? Oh, we well, see, that that was the Edinburgh Fringe. We took Get Your Own Back. I wasn't even going to do it. We took the Get Your Own Back show, which we'd kind of done for the students off the back of the CBBC show. And we took it uh, to Edinburgh and it was very, how can I say, it was extremely well received. Um, more so than I ever thought it had a right to be, but it was a great thing. And so we, we took the show up there and one of the contestants on the show was uh, one Andrew River, um, who came on the show with one of his characters from his play, a, a guy called Jay Podmore, who was playing Ryan Martin, who it was like internet? It's actually when you think about it, that's quite prophetic, because of what it was, the premise of what it was. So right, the, to give you a clue, Ryan was on a publicity tip because he basically had, yeah, he was the doyen of the internet. Everybody loved him until he put down a sentence that was so insulting and so offensive that he lost his millions of subscribers overnight. So he was on a charm offensive. One of the charm offensives was he had to come on my show. And so he came along, Jay Popmore, totally in character, did this whole thing. And there was just something about the way that they were filming us that made Andrew, the writer, just go, I have an idea. And he'd seen about what happened with my life and more or less based it. Um, he, made it he made it sort of hyper real. So uh, instead of me trying to get myself back on my feet, it was, in fact, 
I was helping uh, his character, this Ryan Martin character, get himself back on his feet because of, you know, through my experiences of how it happens. And it was really, it was good fun to do. It was very cathartic, actually. But that's how I was approached. But before then, I've been approached by all manner of people wanting to do films, documentaries, always in the vein where basically I was always the victim and, you know, with no way of getting out. They, you know, they just wanted to show a man down, as it were, and not a man fighting. As one documentary maker said to me, he said, what's the fun in that? We just want to see you hurt. <laughs> Which I thought, well, that's not a documentary at all. It's just a roasting for an hour on a telly. Um, so it was a really interesting one. And he wrote it in a way where he poked enough fun. There was enough fact in it. There was enough fiction in it. And he he wasn't out there just to ridicule. He was out there to make, well, a name for himself and to write a really good comedy, to which I'm very pleased to say we got an award. So it was great. Great stuff. Great stuff. That's really yeah. cool. And uh, let's put this down. Andrew River, Andrew River is his name. Andrew River, like the watery flowing stuff that goes through towns and things on the way to the sea. And he's a very, 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 very good writer. Indeed. And it was a great series. And uh, of course, you know, uh, helped uh, bring you back into the spotlight, really. And a lot of fans who of, of your work many years ago have watched it. And all those little all those little gems about Get Your Own Back and even like the cameos like Pat Sharp have just been wonderful to see. <laughs> Again, that was all down to Andrew River. I mean, he really had a great eye for detail, a great eye for attention. And also... I think the reason why I quite liked him was he had a love of the subject as well. And that was quite a lovely thing. He he viewed the situation as, as what it was, you know, and a, a lot of people didn't. They liked the idea that they're watching a guy. They, what they want, I think what a lot of people wanted to see was the guy get up only to fall again. That's what people quite like. Whereas Andrew just thought, well, let's just write this in the sense where you've kind of made your peace with it, but you're going to help other people that haven't. And it was just really, really sweet. And it was just, you know, we, we included lots of real things. And he knew a lot about me even before he'd met me. So it was really interesting. He's that kind of a guy, very analytical mind. And that's why he makes a really good script writer. Definitely. And it's a great series. Dave, it has been really great chatting with you tonight. And, um, you know, thank you so much for making time to chat with me. And, you know, like I say, it's still awesome. You're still going, you're still entertaining people and you love doing what you do. And I hope you continue for many more years. But before you go, could you tell us where to find you online? Oh, my goodness. Right. OK, so the easiest one would be DaveBensonPhillips.com, I think, two L's in Phillips, and it's .com. And it's got all manner of stuff up there. And if not, I've got a Twitter page as well where I seem to be most busy. And that's at Dave Benson Phil, capital D, capital B, capital P and Phil with two L's on the end. Um, yeah. And that's where you can find me doing all manner of stuff, launching my um, I'm trying to uh, develop my YouTube channel and everything else. And, yeah, it's good fun. I've just been approached about another TV programme and somebody wants me to do a pitch for another. It's, yeah, it's really nice. I think it's just, yeah, it's just lovely. I'll, I'll stop now because I'm going to start chewing my own teeth. <laughs> no, I'm very happy for you, Dave. It's really it's really good that despite, you know, that, that bit of a dip, you know, you've, 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 you've got back on your feet and you're happy and that's fantastic. We try, sir. We try. May it never happen to you that bit. It's an awful thing. But there you go. We weather it. We are human and we get on with it. So, Dave, it's been great chatting with you today. Thank you so much. It's all right. Not a problem at all. And thank you very much for letting me speak. And thank you, people, for listening to this particular podcast. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed that, why not check out the other podcast interviews available? And don't forget to check out my blog page as well. Link is in the description. Until next time, see you soon. 